We left off just sort of talking about the intrinsic mechanisms. Um, and this is basically how we keep GFR constant. So even though our mean arterial pressure can fluctuate, we want to keep GFR at 125 uh, min milligrams per minute. Um, and so essentially, we've got this idea here on the left. So this is an entirely different mechanism. This is the myogenic regulation. If we raise our mean arterial pressure, what would otherwise tend to happen is we would see an increase in glomerular capillary pressure, which would lead to an increase in GFR, right? If you were to raise mean, excuse me, raise mean arterial pressure, you would tend to see an increase in GFR as a result. What this mechanism does, which is being shown on the right here, is counteracts that. So because of that stretch on those afferent arterial cells, those smooth muscle cells, which causes increased resistance there, we then decrease the glomerular capillary pressure, which negates that rise in GFR. So essentially, GFR would stay the same. Okay, it's really important to make that note here that although GFR tries to raise, we do something to decrease it, and it essentially stays the same. Same thing happening on the right here, but just an entirely different mechanism. Um, if we raise mean arterial pressure, what would tend to happen if it were otherwise unchecked is we would raise pressure, raise the glomerular capillary pressure, and raise GFR. Now, in order to prevent that rise in GFR and keep it constant, we see the other mechanism here, which is that the macular denser cells detect this rise in GFR, this rise in pressure, um, because of that rise in flow rate coming through the distal convoluted tubule. Remember, macular denser cells are found in the distal tubule. They will then send these paracrine signals, which are chemical signals, to the afferent arterial cells and bring about the same response. They're gonna cause constriction, increase resistance, which decreases that glomerular capillary pressure and decreases GFR. So in the face of this raising GFR, we decrease glomerular capillary pressure and that keeps GFR the same. So the same response or the same outcome is brought about, but we're using two different mechanisms here. The myogenic response, um, which is the natural inherent tendency of those affin arterial cells versus the macula densa response or the tubular glomerular feedback, which is that paracrine signal being sent to those afferent cells as well. Okay, um, so just wanted to kind of touch on that again, uh, add a little bit more clarity. And then we went through the extrinsic controls, which was basically using the sympathetic nervous system um, where we uh, use that as an external mechanism to keep GFR constant as well. Okay. Um, Let's do a few practice questions here and then we'll keep going. So let's take a minute to look at these questions. I'll give you a minute or so to read through each of these um, and then we'll talk about the answers. All right, I'll give you another minute to read through here. And again, when we get to these checkpoint questions, although we don't often have a lot of time to cover them, it's really important that you write an answer down um, so that when you're going over your notes, you have you know, some guidance as far as the answers here. Okay, final 30 seconds or so. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's go through these one by one and feel free to share responses in the chat um, as we go through. Um, so let's start with number one. So indicate whether the GFR would tend to rise or fall in response to an increase in each of the following. So the first one, or the first condition is the glomerular filtration pressure. 
So if we see an increase in glomerular filtration pressure, would GFR rise or fall? GFR would rise, excellent. And that kind of just makes sense. If we have more pressure coming in, we see a higher filtration rate um, and a higher GFR. Um, the second condition, if the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure were to increase. So if we increase our glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, would we see a rise or a drop in GFR? So I'm seeing a drop um, and I want us to kind of think about this. So we're looking at the pressure in the glomerular capillary that's pushing out into the Bowman space. So would GFR drop or rise? You can kind of rethink that. So it looks like someone else is saying rise. So rise is correct, right? Again, thinking about where you're standing, glomerular capillary, think about what direction that force is moving in, it's pushing. So if we're in the glomerular capillary, pushing out into the Bowman's capsule, this would also tend to rise, or, or sorry, GFR would also tend to rise if this pressure increased as well. It's a force that is favoring filtration, right? So both the first two conditions would favor filtration. And if so, if, if they rose, GFR would rise. Um, the third condition here is that the glomer there's an increase in the glomerular capillary osmotic pressure. So an increase in the glomerular capillary osmotic pressure. Would this cause a raise in GFR? This would fall, excellent. So I'm seeing a response here. This would drop or fall. Um, and again, thinking about where we are located, we're in the glomerular capillary, but now this is a pull force. So we're pulling fluid from the Bowman space back into the glomerular capillary. This is a force that is opposing filtration. And so if this force raised, right, if we increased this force, we would decrease GFR, we decrease our filtration rate, all right? Um, the next one here, the hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's capsule. So the hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's capsule, would that, if that increased, would that increase GFR or decrease GFR? Decrease, excellent. So again, thinking about, so it's really important to use this kind of mechanism where you think about where you are, we're in the Bowman's capsule, and then we think about the direction of that force. It's a hydrostatic force, it's gonna be pushing back into the glomerular capillary. And so this would be also opposing filtration. Um, so if this were to increase, GFR would decrease. Okay, it's opposing that GFR. And then the final condition here, the uh, concentration of proteins in the plasma. So if we had an increase in the concentration of proteins in the plasma, would we see an increase or decrease in GFR? And this is a little bit more of a complex scenario because you have to think about what force this is favoring, right? So someone is saying neither, um, and that's not correct. We want to think about what force this would be favoring and then think about, we know that proteins exert an oncotic force. So something's going to happen, right? So it's not going to be neither. If we've got more proteins in our plasma, in other words, in our glomerular capillary, which of our forces is increasing there? So more proteins in our plasma is actually mimicking the second scenario, not the second, excuse me, the third scenario here, the glomerular capillary osmotic pressure, okay? Um, oops. Saying that the concentration of proteins, <clears throat> excuse me, in the plasma increases is the exact same thing as saying the glomerular capillary osmotic pressure increases, all right? And so, if we have that increase in that glomerular capillary osmotic pressure, 
we would decrease the GFR, right? That is a force that is opposing filtration and that would decrease GFR. So it's really important to understand, although we're not seeing it in the direct terms, what force are we describing when we say that concentrations of proteins increase in one space or the other? If I were to say that the concentration of proteins increased in the Bowman space, what force would that be favoring? Any ideas here? <clears throat> okay, so a concentration, uh, an increased protein concentration in the Bowman space, although we, although we know that that is abnormal, that should never happen unless there's some type of nephritis, some type of injury to the glomerulus. Um, that would favor filtration because we now have an oncotic or osmotic pull existing in the Bowman space, pulling fluid from glomerular capillary into the Bowman space so that would be a force favoring filtration, all right? Um, okay, I hope that was clear there. Um, number two, name three intrinsic control mechanisms that regulate the GFR and briefly explain how these mechanisms work to keep GFR constant in the face of changes in the mean arterial pressure. Okay, so just to kind of go through this here um, in the interest of time, we talked about those three mechanisms. One, the myogenic response or myogenic feedback um, this was the inherent property, the inherent nature of the afferent arterial cells to uh, contract if there's excess stretch or to stretch if there's relaxation. Okay, and again, that is similar to what we see in, in, our, vascular, in our vascular arterials. Um, the second mechanism was the tubular glomerular feedback. This is where the macular denser cells of the distal convoluted tubule can detect the change in GFR and they do so by detecting how much flow is coming through. So if a lot of fluid is ending up in the distal convoluted tubule, that means that the GFR is increasing. We have a lot more fluid being filtered. And so in order to combat that, they send these paracrine signals, so basically cell-to-cell -cell messages, to tell the afferent arterial cells to constrict or contract and to slow down that GFR, slow down that flow rate. Um, the third mechanism was the mesangial cells. So mesangial cells are the cells that are sort of nestled in between that tuft of capillaries, and they do a similar thing. They will detect the, the, um, the state of that afferent arterial, how much contraction is happening on that afferent arterial, and then they will again send signals to the um, afferent arterial cells and tell them to slow down the weight. So the response the feedback response is the same. We just have three different mechanisms or routes of that communication, okay? And that is what helps us keep GFR constant, even though mean arterial pressure is fluctuating. Um, and then number three is the control of afferent and efferent arterial resistance by renal sympathetic neurons, an example of intrinsic control or extrinsic control. So is this extrinsic or intrinsic? Any ideas here? So this is pretty straightforward. So this is extrinsic, okay? When we talk about neurotransmitters, when we talk about hormones, this is a, a, an extrinsic mechanism of control. Um, and the why is that it's not involving the kidneys locally, right? It's involving outside influences such as the autonomic nervous system. Um, and then how does an increase in sympathetic activity tend to affect GFR? So just jumping back to this flow chart, an increase in sympathetic signal is going to tend to decrease GFR, okay? It's gonna create sympathetic influence to those vessels, the afferent and efferent arterioles. We know that sympathetic influence to any smooth muscle causes vasoconstriction. And so that vasoconstriction puts more resistance in the flow, so less fluid can actually get filtered. And so GFR decreases, right? Um, and that is again, a protective mechanism. If we can slow down GFR, um, we can help preserve or reserve some of that fluid loss and we can correct some of the initial signals that would um, begin to trigger that increase in sympathetic activity, like hemorrhaging and sweating and so on. <clears throat> 